here. Um, and you're giving me some sort of hand signal uh, five minutes before I should stop. Uh, especially if I'm supposed to leave uh, five minutes for uh, five minutes before the next lecture. Well, that yeah. There, there is lunch at the end. We'll eat into lunch. Right. Fine. But literally eat at the lunch. All right. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, let me just give you an outline of what uh, I intend to talk about in these three lectures. Uh, first, in the first one this morning, I'm going to try to give you a very broad brush overview of uh, some of the things that astrochemistry means to me. And uh, it's such a broad interdisciplinary uh, area that I think the, the best that I can hope to do is uh, give you some, uh, some sort of insight into uh, the wonderland of outer space that is the kinds of environments that atoms and molecules live in, in uh, interstellar space, in the expanding envelopes around dying stars and comets and the outer atmospheres and planets, uh, various other astronomical phenomena, because these conditions are often very, very different from the intuition that you develop about atoms and molecules in the laboratory, especially regarding the density and pressure. Uh, so that, that's what I'm going to try to accomplish in the first lecture, just to give you a very broad uh, overview. Uh, I'll uh, give, uh, I'll go through one uh, example of an astrochemical system, namely the chemistry of the early universe in the first half, and then I'll talk more generally just about uh, interstellar matter and the conditions for atoms and molecules in the second half of this talk. Uh, in the second lecture, I'm going to try to be a little bit more detailed and focused about uh, the interaction between radiation and uh, molecules, and how that's applied to make models of astrophysical systems. And then at least one of the other lecturers, uh, Stefano, will be probably talking more about the, uh, the nature of the models themselves, but I'll be talking mostly about processes. And then finally, I'm going to try to amuse you with a couple of case studies. So I'd better race on just some general blah blah about astrochemistry because I, I don't have any idea about the backgrounds of the audience. So I assume most of you focus mostly on uh, atomic and molecular physics and the processes and spectroscopy perhaps and less on the astrophysics. But uh, for me, the, the crucial thing is to develop an intuition about how to connect the microscopic world, the quantum mechanical world, with things that happen in space, and how this uh, affects the evolution, the cosmic evolution of things in, in our physical universe, uh, from galaxies to uh, stars and planets around them. Uh, okay, and so the things that we have to work with in the dilute, very low density uh, collections of matter in, in the universe are atoms, molecules, also solid dust particles, microscopic dust particles, and of course electromagnetic radiation of all colors. Uh, so the, the, the entire, well for some of us at least, the, the entire electromagnetic spectrum is of interest to us both for how the atoms and molecules interact where they live, but also for the spectroscopic diagnostic probes that we can apply to our observations to actually understand what, uh, what it is, the, what the experiment is that nature is conducting uh, far away and uh, sometimes long ago. Uh, so again, atomic and molecular processes in astrochemistry play two roles. One is a diagnostic role for us to understand observations. The other is a much more fundamental role in controlling how matter actually behaves and how, for example, extremely dilute clouds of mostly molecular hydrogen can actually uh, collapse under their own gravity uh, to form compact things like stars and planets. 
Okay, so uh, in astronomy we have things like this to work with and hopefully to explain. I think also sometimes the images that we can find in astronomy are, are things that are inspiring in their own right because they, they make us curious. And the, the better, the clearer the images that we have, of course, the, the even, even more striking that sensation of, of wonder can be. So there are a couple of things that I want you to keep, keep in mind, perhaps throughout the week. And that is, first of all, the, the concept of what is microscopic may mean something different in astronomy than in our usual experience. For example, just consider the mean free path of an atom or molecule in, um, in the air that we're breathing here near standard temperature and pressure conditions. The mean free path for, for an oxygen or a nitrogen molecule is very, very short. And that, that's one way of defining a microscopic scale for processes, the mean free path that something can travel. Uh, but in space, it turns out in the diffuse interstellar medium, the mean free path for the collision between the most abundant things in the gas, say hydrogen molecules, or a rare free electron in a molecule, that mean free path may be comparable to the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's microscopic for, for the uh, the microscopic scale for the astronomical point of view. Okay. And the, the second thing that I'll be coming back to, especially in the, my second lecture, is that the reason that we're interested in the microscopic details of atoms and molecules and their interactions is precisely because we have to, because the conditions in the regions we want to understand, the conditions are often very far from a condition of thermodynamic equilibrium. So in fact, we have to do a much more general kinetic analysis to interpret spectra. The details matter. And we have to consider the race of uh, processes in order to understand how they compete and which ones are the dominant ones. OK, so one story I'm going to tell you for a few minutes now concerns uh, the beginning of chemistry, the very beginning of chemistry. And uh, we now have a good idea that the expansion of the universe began about 13.7 giga years ago, and that the only raw materials present in the form of baryons, uh, normal matter, uh, were the stable isotopes of hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Uh, and that's just about all. Um, and approximately 300,000 years later, after the beginning of that expansion in the Big Bang, one could say that astro astrochemistry began, in the sense that it's at about that epoch, epoch when the first chemical bonds formed and uh, caused some fraction of the uh, baryonic matter to exist as molecules mainly of hydrogen, even so in a very small fraction, as we'll see. Um, and uh, actually, during, during my professional lifetime, there's been a radical change in what we can do with this kind of, of question about the beginning, beginning of chemistry. One of the changes uh, is that, uh, well, the people who study cosmology, the large-scale structure and evolution of the universe, claim that cosmology is now, uh, now an exact science uh, because it's possible to put rather small error bars on important, uh, important measures of the large-scale structure of the universe even as it was 13.7 giga years ago. So that means that there is much less uncertainty in, uh, in the basic boundary conditions uh, as a function of time in the expanding universe. Okay. The other thing, of course, is there has been tremendous progress in our understanding of uh, atomic molecular spectra and uh, processes and interactions. OK, uh, my former PhD student, Bill Ladder, did as part of his PhD thesis.
one of the early studies of this chemistry, of primordial chemistry, what can you make out of hydrogen, helium, and lithium only, plus radiation. And uh, this is the history of the universe's three graphs. What we use instead of proper time since the Big Bang, rather is an observable property, namely the redshift, which is the uh, 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 amount of redshifting of the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation as it moves through an expanding universe. So very, very distant sources from us have to traverse a much greater distance through an expanding universe, and the light suffers uh, an enormous redshift, similar to a Doppler shift. But it's not to be understood exactly as a Doppler shift. It's, uh, it's the, uh, a similar sort of wavelength shift, but as a result of the cosmic expansion. So this means that we can map, we can use the redshift z uh, as a surrogate for, for time. It's just that the redshift runs in the opposite direction. Uh, so these are typically oh, that's the uh, logarithmic scales with redshift uh, 10. And then as we go to redshift 0, that's the current time, uh, the current hour current event in space time is redshift 0. Going back to uh, redshifts greater than 1,000 uh, takes us into the epoch when uh, owing basically just to uh, adiabatic expansion, both the matter and radiation in the universe have cooled to a temperature of a few thousand Kelvin. And at that time, the average density of matter um, was still high enough that some of the first interesting atomic processes could take place at rates that remained faster than the, the rates of absorption and re-emission of electromagnetic radiation. Now, up until this time also, uh, the matter and radiation were strongly coupled uh, until uh, a redshift of around 1,000, at which point the temperature of the radiation uh, continued to expand with one exponent, a uh, characteristic of the therm thermodynamics of a, uh, a boson uh, system. And uh, the matter uh, deviated from that. This departure of the two temperatures was because the matter and radiation lost thermal contact. And the last, uh, the last important process, in fact, was nothing more than uh, simple Thomson scattering of uh, photons by the free electrons. It was also at about this time that the rate of electron capture by free protons uh, uh, was uh, able to, still able to keep up with the cosmic expansion rate to cause the gas, mostly hydrogen, to become neutral. And then it was possible well, it is now possible for us to imagine a simple model of this system containing a few component parts, atoms, uh, uh, plus radiation. The radiation has remained, that initial radiation has remained uh, uh, equilibrium radiation, so well-defined by a black body spectrum, a Planck function. In fact, the original radiation is still from the present time. It's only filling a larger and larger volume, so its effective temperature continues to decrease. It's currently 2.725 Kelvin. That's the temperature of the, of the cosmic background radiation. It is still there, it can be detected. Um, okay, the density de decreases as we go from the distant past toward the current epoch. And this is actually the logarithm of the number density of hydrogen and notice that this uh, marker is about 10 to the minus 5 per cubic centimeter. Back here, before recombination started, uh, it was a bit over 10,000 per cubic centimeter. OK. And so basically, there are only a few equations that we need to solve simultaneously in order to describe this chemical system in an expanding universe. And first of all, there, there is an equation that describes the 
uh, critical density for matter uh, in a, a flat cosmic geometry. And the cosmologists now tell us that the overall geometry of the universe is approximately flat, uh, meaning that there's, there's no large-scale uh, gravitational curvature. And the thing that keeps it flat is the, the, this large, mysterious contribution of, uh, of dark matter and dark energy. So that it, we have, have to be reminded that the baryonic component of matter that we can actually observe is a very small fraction of everything that is there and everything else that is affecting the properties of, of our world, of our universe, as it still continues to expand. Uh, the, uh, uh, another equation is one that simply uh, relates the expansion rate in terms of the Hubble constant as a function of the redshift. It relates the expansion rate to the different components of uh, density, the matter of radiation and uh, the uh, dark energy or the cosmological constant, whatever you want to call it. And so the, um, the numbers that actually define these properties are fairly, fairly well known. Uh, nuclear processes are mostly well known enough that it is thought that the uh, primordial fractions of hydrogen, helium, and deuterium, uh, and lithium that froze out at the end of the uh, sort of nuclear dominated phase of the Big Bang are fairly well uh, constrained. There's a lot of observational work that can still be done to put observational limits on that to test against the theoretical models. Uh, anyway, I'd better accelerate along with the rest of the universe. <laughs> uh, and then there's, then there's a chemical rate equation. Um, uh, sort of, well, no, this is the, the equation of state, you might say. The rate, it relates the rate of change of the matter temperature uh, to the uh, uh, rate of change of the scaling factor of the universe, sort of the radius of, of the expansion radius of the universe. That's just the basically the uh, wave of jet lag just struck. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> adiabatic expansion. Uh, Things cool because they expand. Uh, then uh, the, there is a balance between energy gains and energy losses due to constant scattering. That is just the interaction of the radiation and the matter, uh, the last. Uh, and uh, then the gains and losses in energy, that is, heating and cooling processes that are molecular in nature through uh, reactions and uh, other kinds of interactions with the radiation uh, and the uh, chemical terms. Uh, wrong button. Okay, so uh, I've said a lot of uh, a lot of this already. Early on, the matter and radiation were strongly coupled by uh, because there were the, the material was mostly fully ionized. Uh, there were lots of free electrons around, and uh, the scattering of radiation by the electrons was able to keep both the radiation and the matter thermalized at the same temperature. Uh, but then, uh, as you can imagine, if the universe expands to become dilute enough, then uh, the uh, rate of scattering of radiation may become uh, enough uh, faster than the rates of collisions between the electrons and uh, the ions in the gas that the, uh, the matter will cool faster than the radiation. And uh, that's what causes this uh, decoupling of the matter and the radiation. At a temperature somewhat below 10,000 10, Kelvin, uh, the uh, rates of continuing photoionization of hydrogen and of um, electron capture, mainly radiative recombination, uh, 
then can, can no longer keep things close to uh, equilibrium, steady state prevails, and uh, gradually but steadily, uh, the universe becomes neutral. The neutral matter becomes transparent to the predominant radiation, that is, most of the radiation that is within a few decades of frequency of the peak of the black body at a temperature of about a thousand Kelvin. That is, uh, radiation that is, is much too cool and red to continue photoionizing hydrogen. So that kind of process uh, completely uh, vanishes, or the rate is vanishingly small, so it's not important. The neutral matter becomes transparent radiation. So the nature of the universe changes uh, dramatically at that point. But this recombination, the cosmic recombination, takes uh, quite some time. It turns out there's a surprising, uh, surprisingly rich chemistry that can happen with so few uh, raw materials. And it's possible for hydrogen molecules to form in two ways, purely by gas phase processes. These are intrinsically slow because they depend upon uh, the emission of a photon during the encounter because the density is already far too low for three-body processes to be important at all. Okay, so the only way to form uh, molecular bonds in a system like this is by radiatively stabilized association processes. So for example, uh, a hydrogen and a free proton can collide and with some probability form an H2 plus, the simplest molecule, the, the hydrogen molecular ion. Uh, since the gas is mostly hydrogen and it's mostly the most abundant neutral at this stage is already uh, neutral atomic hydrogen, then the H2 plus has a high probability of undergoing a charge transfer with H to form the neutral H2, and then it actually returns a proton. So this is, uh, in a sense, a, a small catalytic cycle, a chemist might say, uh, with a bit of imagination. Similarly, there's another route to forming H2, and that's by the radiative attachment of a free electron to a hydrogen atom to form the anion, H minus. And that, had, that occurs with a, an under, uh, in principle, measurable or calculable rate, right? And likewise, that can, can be followed, among other, other competing processes, can be followed by uh, an associative detachment process in which the, uh, the electron is lost and recycled, another catalytic cycle, uh, and H2 is formed. But there are things that compete, uh, like these processes. When you solve all of these equations simultaneously, the ones for the chemical kinetics, the ones for the uh, equation of state, the matter in the universe, uh, plus the cosmological equations, then uh, you can track how the abundances of various species uh, change with redshift or with proper time through this uh, epoch of recombination. So again, on a logarithmic scale here, uh, you can get asymptotically approaching the present, uh, a roughly constant fraction, molecular fraction, and it's only of the order of 10 to the minus 5 of, of all of the hydrogen. So the molecular content of the universe after the epoch of recombination, the molecular content is not uh, very great, uh, but it's not negligible, and it turns out to be important if there's to be any hope for some kinds of structure to arise in the universe. Uh, now about structure, I should say a word or two about what is actually happening in cosmology, the way that cosmologists do it, but this, this is the one or two sentence summary. Um, the, uh, it appears as supported by fascinating observations of spatial fluctuations in the brightness of the cosmic background radiation as seen now. These fluctuations in brightness are evidently due to fluctuations in density of the free electrons at the last scattering surface.
before the matter and radiation lost contact with each other. These fluctuations in density are primordial, said to be primordial fluctuations. There are, are ideas either about how they arose or how to describe them. Uh, you know, combining some, for me, very exotic statistical mechanics and field theory, describing the, uh, the early expansion of the universe. But in any case, there, there is observational evidence for these fluctuations. The largest of the fluctuations in density do have the possibility of, to grow and amplify with time. And so later on, after the matter, the baryonic matter, has turned neutral and transparent, there might be a possibility for smaller scale structures to, uh, to grow out of uh, these uh, original fluctu density fluctuations, at least the largest of them. However, the smallest scale that, that can actually condense into a, a gravitationally bound structure like a star or a planet or on a larger scale even a galaxy of stars uh, is limited by the temperature that the matter uh, can achieve and the rate at which that can happen in comparison with the uh, <coughs> gravitational collapse because the, the gravitational collapse of the gas cloud uh, of course thermodynamically forces the gas to heat up and if it remains hot, then the, the pressure can resist further collapse. And if that happens before a small enough structure has, uh, has become to, has come to, uh, uh, into gravitational equilibrium, then uh, that's the limit to which uh, uh, structures can form, the lower limit uh, to the scale of structures. So, to make a long story short, the reason molecules are important in the early universe is that they provide the possibility of cooling gas to temperatures below 10,000 Kelvin and to forming structures that are smaller on toward our time, to forming gravitationally bound structures that are smaller than 100,000 solar masses, 100,000 times the mass of the sun. So in order to form things like stars, uh, as far as we understand, it, well, it, there either have to be molecules or uh, that's the best way to understand it, at least. So the, one of the reasons that the molecules are important uh, in our universe is that they provide the first low temperature coolants that allow relatively small structures to have any possibility of forming in our expanding universe before the expansion just takes uh, everything out to form a very, very dilute and very, very cold uh, and uninteresting universe. So uh, the spice in the recipe is supplied by the molecules, perhaps. That's what we'd like to tell the funding agencies to tell <laughs> as for chemistry, right? Okay, and uh, so one can follow also some of the minor species, see how as a function of redshift or time, using redshift as a time stamp, the reverse time stamp, uh, how the lithium ions re recombine, how the helium ions recombine, finally the hydrogen. Um, maybe it's worth pointing out just as a footnote that uh, the very first chemical bonds uh, actually probably involved, uh, involved helium. Right. So we have to erase what we were told in our very, very first chemistry classes that uh, the inert gases are called inert gases because they don't form chemical bonds, they don't do chemistry. But in fact, that's not true in space. And, and at least uh, two uh, noble gas containing molecular ions have now been, uh, have now been structurally identified in space. Uh, so helium-2 plus and helium hydride plus were probably the very first molecules to form. And that's because the helium was already turning neutral before much of the hydrogen uh, had recombined. Okay, and uh, one uh, can calculate molecular abundances 
the abundance ratios, uh, in this case of a range of 10, but that's sort of the asymptotic limit of the simple model of the cosmic chemistry. Okay, so that, that's an, an example of, uh, of one kind of astrochemical system which we believe that we can analyze and understand in some fairly quantitative detail. And uh, the model actually makes predictions. Unfortunately, there's almost nothing that's directly observable about, uh, about these things happening through the epoch of free combination yet. I mean, we might still uh, keep looking, but uh, well, maybe maybe I could we could discuss more of that uh, later. But to see how this initial cosmic chemistry that takes us through the epoch of recombination to make the universe neutral or the matter in the universe neutral, uh, to see how this leads to other things, then the cosmologists busy themselves with doing enormous massive numerical simulations of model universes uh, to test all kinds of other kind of, of astronomical observations uh, and to try to understand uh, on theoretical grounds how the structure arises. And so the current uh, sorts of cosmological simulations uh, show that at some point the large scale structures look like a network of filaments and that the nodes where these intersect are the places where the largest pileups of concentrated matter uh, occur. The things that eventually form superclusters of galaxies and then on smaller scales as they resolve, uh, resolve these computed theoretical structures to smaller and smaller scales then down to the scales of clusters of a few thousand galaxies and uh, scales of galaxies themselves. And they can even make fairly interesting uh, predictions about some of the details of the structures that are going to uh, uh, be the intermediate steps in the, in the formation of galaxies and of stars within them, although at this point they have to use uh, very, very simplified descriptions of how star formation depends on density very, very few details. Um, I'm yeah, actually going to have to accelerate our piece of the universe here and not go into detail about this, but this is a kind of cartoon diagram of the insight that is gained from these cosmological simulations. And again, these are things that can now be constrained by real observations. So it, it's not it's not entirely theoreticians magic. And what we end up with is something that looks like this. And this is a real Im image. This is one of the outputs of, uh, of the uh, Hubble uh, Ultra Deep Field Survey that is long exposures with the Hubble Space Telescope that were combined, uh, pointing at a, a mostly empty piece of the sky. There's only one bright star in this entire field of view. It's this one image here that has the diffraction spikes. I'm afraid the lights are a little bit, especially the fluorescent things, are a little bit uh, too bright for this to have its. Uh, don't, don't worry, I'm going to have to go on ahead anyway. So, uh, just imagine uh, under the clear Arizona skies that you're seeing a little patch of sky that's filled with nothing but images of galaxies, very distant galaxies, systems. Okay, there's a long list of things that still remain to be done as astrochemical questions about this, especially later on as we get more into the epoch of the uh, early condensation of smaller scale structures. Uh, but I don't have, have the time to go into that. Uh, to, to change gears, let me just throw out one of my favorite quotations that even, even though we have these beautiful astronomical images that if, if you love atoms and molecules and spectroscopy as I do, then um, a good spectrum can be worth a thousand pictures. And just to emphasize this, this is also one of my favorite picture sets. My daughter, many years ago, on our first trip to New York City, 
in the uh, Museum of Natural History, I think. And uh, just in October, we went, went back to New York City where she was um, looking, for, looking at uh, Turing Colleges and universities to apply to. Um, the, the universe expands, even on very small scales. Uh, just one last sort of cosmologically tinged thing. It turns out that the, the marvelous tools that astronomers have to work with now, like the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array in Chile, this array of radio telescopes, make it possible to probe really interesting phenomena involving molecules. I don't have time to explain this in detail, but basically the background image is just to set, set the scale for some interesting molecular observations that were made with the hallmark uh, of uh, observations of carbon monoxide emission lines and also an atomic carbon fine structure line uh, in uh, a, uh, a galaxy at a redshift of 2.8. Now that's a redshift of 2.8 for the non astronomers. It's actually it's very, very far away. That is an extremely distant galaxy. The reason that it's possible actually to detect the radiation from that distant galaxy in this case is because that galaxy lies uh, by accident behind a, uh, a much closer galaxy in a massive cluster of galaxies. And the concentration of mass in the closer system is high enough to cause a gravitational lens. A gravitational lens that amplifies the brightness of the electromagnetic radiation coming from this very distant galaxy. Not only that, it produces a, a two or more distinct images, two bright ones and a third a dimmer one. These are gravitationally lensed images of the same galaxy and allow us actually, through the observations, to resolve, we use the gravitational lens provided by nature to actually resolve the, the, a little bit crudely about the distribution of molecular gas across that distant galaxy. But if we didn't have molecules to produce line radiation like this, of course, we wouldn't have a clue. But we do have a way, actually, of then using the kinematical analysis of the actual of the true Doppler shifts of radiation across the image of that galaxy to tell us about how the mass is distributed in the galaxy and other things. Okay. Now, um, in the last few minutes, I want to race through some of some of the, some of the description of what conditions are like. Uh, this is the molecules. I view of, of life in the diffuse interstellar medium. And what, what's it like to live there for a molecule? So the first thing that, we're going to, that we have to recognize is that there can be extreme departures from thermodynamic equilibrium. Not only for the molecules interacting with each other, that is through elastic and inelastic collisions, reactive collisions, but also a further radiation of matter. And the simple, one of the simplest things to say is that the temperature that characterizes much of the radiation the molecules feel comes from hot stars, or the radiation the molecules feel most intensely comes from hot stars. Uh, and that has a very different characteristic color temperature than the kinetic temperature that characterizes the microscopic motion molecules themselves. There are also other atomic and molecular motions that occur in space. And these are partly microscopic and partly macroscopic. That is, there are turbulent motions in the gas. And uh, in fact, under these conditions of extremely low density and pressure, it's a real question of whether we can actually describe uh, motions in, in gas the way we would describe the uh, 
uh, steady systematic flows in an ideal gas in the laboratory, for example. Uh, but that's uh, but that's for another time. Uh, there are also things that uh, happen. What the because the the dense because the density is so low and the reaction times are so long, even for extremely rapid processes involving reactive molecular ions and reactive free radicals, the conditions in space allow surprisingly high and observable abundances of free radicals and molecular ions, far out of proportion to what you would ever expect in equilibrium. So, you know, the universe is a gigantic discharge tube or something. Like that. Anyway, and some of the most, some of those fascinating things are the reactive, very, very reactive molecular ions, I think. Um, okay, and so this, this means that if we hope to understand a chemical system in space, then uh, we have to treat the kinetics directly. So let, let's leap on to try to think of some concept of like the cloud. Uh, what do we mean by, by a cloud of gas in space? Well, something that's uh, uh, concentrated and localized in some, some volume of space. You know. Now, of course, from our viewing these things at a great distance, uh, we only see uh, signals that appear to us as a projection on the uh, on the plane of the sky or on the great sphere, but uh, small pieces at a time, or like, a, uh, like the plane of the sky. Uh, but we do actually have a third dimension in our observations, and that's because there are always, always larger scale and often systematic motions of gas clouds and stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and these motions are easily large enough to cause measurable Doppler shifts in the uh, spectrum lines of atoms and molecules that are either absorbing background starlight, for example, or are emitting uh, very, very low frequency radiation uh, that's uh, sort of quasi-thermally excited in the clouds themselves. And so the, uh, the patterns of Doppler shift that we see on the sky are also ways of isolating what gas belongs together in what you might call or visualize as a cloud. Okay, now it's also possible by mapping the emissions of molecules in this galactic interstellar medium, we can see systematically those systematic effects, that is clouds here and there uh, uh, rotating about the center of the Milky Way galaxy a relatively thin disk, together with the youngest stars. Uh, but if we look at detail within a cloud, it's actually possible to observe hierarchies of structures. That is, one can analyze the probability distribution functions of gas functions. That is, the, uh, the dispersion of the Doppler shifts within uh, a gravitationally bound cloud, and to map uh, apparent variations in density and temperature. And these show hierarchical structures that are reminiscent of turbulence. So that, that's a very active research, uh, research area, as well as to understand uh, the nature of this, uh, of this turbulence, uh, both how it, at, at very small scales, how it affects microscopic processes, uh, but on the intermediate and larger scales, uh, how it participates, how the turbulence either, either limits or assists the growth of gravitational condensations, that is, the formation of stars. Okay, in, uh, in the kind of, in, in the part of the interstellar medium that we're usually mostly interested in, that is where molecules uh, are seen. Uh, it's a very weakly ionized plasma, meaning that the electron fraction may be one part per billion up to, at most, a few parts in 10 to the minus 4 by number of 
So that's pretty weakly ionized. But still, that's enough, uh, at least until you get to the very, very lowest ranges of ionization. Uh, that, that's enough to keep uh, the magnetic field uh, uh, dynamically coupled to the gas. And that's another important role that molecules play, that astrochemistry plays in the growth of structure of the formation of stars and planets. And that is through uh, the interaction of charged species, free electrons and positive ions, the interactions of charged species with the magnetic field and how that affects the dynamics of the gas. Okay, and I keep saying over and over again, far from equilibrium. Uh, okay, this is uh, just a simple sort of diagram to outline uh, regimes of uh, interstellar clouds and of chemistry. And there will be more to say about this uh, in, in later lectures in this, this course, I'm sure. Um, it turns out there is enough diffuse starlight in space that through relatively thin clouds at low density, the, uh, the background of ultraviolet starlight is uh, intense enough uh, to keep most of the molecules photodissociated, that is to maintain a, a mostly purely atomic gas over a large amount of the volume. However, if a large enough projected column density of hydrogen molecules and associated dust particles are built up, then there's a naturally occurring relatively thin boundary that uh, takes place between uh, atomic and molecular gas and uh, in, in most places in the galactic interstellar medium. This corresponds to uh, projected column densities of around 2 times 10 to the 20 hydrogens per square centimeter. Okay, projected density, a column of, uh, of uh, hydrogen in all forms. Uh, that's the thick thickness of the layer that is required to provide enough shielding so that the average background starlight capable of dissociating hydrogen molecules is completely taken away. I'll talk about this in more detail in my second lecture tomorrow. Uh, and uh, then as we go deeper and deeper, that is through thicker and thicker columns of hydrogen and associated dust particles, uh, we enter regimes where the nature of the dominant molecular process has changed. And uh, in this interesting intermediate part, uh, there are ion neutral processes that uh, owe their origin to starlight ionization and starlight dis dissociation, the production of radicals and reactive ions. Uh, and then at some point, ultraviolet starlight has, has been absorbed out in the shielding layers and then we have to look elsewhere for a source of, uh, uh, of anything to drive uh, an active chemistry. And these are just a few of the characteristics of these different regimes. Again, these are in the slides that are online, so I think I'll skip uh, just uh, reading bullets for you. I, I've said most of this already. Um, but let me just uh, take one example to talk about um, uh, temperatures. The astronomers in particular have uh, sometimes the bewildering way to use the concept of, of temperature, especially radio astronomers. Uh, you'll probably be hearing more and much more of this uh, during the week. Okay, but for, for these low flux photo dominated regions or photo dissociation regions where the starlight is still important to the chemistry. The kinetic temperature of the gas tends to be a bit less than 100 Kelvin. Uh, the ionization of carbon, uh, atomic carbon, the balance between C plus and neutral carbon uh, corresponds to an ion temperature of a few thousand Kelvin 
if you were to describe that ion to neutral ratio uh, as an equilibrium uh, property. It turns out that's actually fairly close to the diluted radiation brightness temperature of the average starlight at our location in galactic space. Maybe not coincidence. Uh, and uh, also, there are some abundant atomic uh, species like uh, neutral carbon, carbon plus, atomic oxygen, that have uh, 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 doublet and triplet ground terms, where the fine structure splitting, the fine structure energy splitting, corresponds to a few tens to a few hundred Kelvin in temperature units. And so these uh, ground term fine structure levels in atoms and atomic ions uh, can still be populated uh, uh, in these regions that uh, produces some of the observable quantum consequences and on and on. Uh, here actually is one of the main slides that I wanted to emphasize for you, and that is the scales. Uh, to think about macrocosm and microcosm again. Uh, if we're talking about one of these low density diffuse molecular columns, starlight is still partly dominant in chemistry. The number densities of hydrogen are of the order of a few hundred per cubic centimeter at most per house. The electron density might be 0.1 per cubic centimeter, temperature of 50 to 30 to 75 Kelvin, and a magnetic field strength of one microgauss. And uh, sorry for using calcium CGS units, but it's actually a good, seems to me, physical reason for physicists to resist uh, the engineering usage and the SI system of units uh, for magnetic properties. Anyway, uh, the cloud diameters, the diameter of a of one of these diffuse gas clouds may be of the order of 3 times 10 to the 16th meters. That's one parsec uh, of astronomers uh, units for uh, observable distance unit, a convenient distance unit. Uh, in, uh, in our part of the galaxy, the average spacing between stars is to order of magnitude one parsec. It corresponds to a little more than three light years. Okay, the mean free path for thermal hydrogen molecules at this temperature uh, is about 0.02 astronomical units, or the astronomical, uh, and that corresponds to 3 times 10 to the 9 meters. The, there's potential for confusion here. AU stands both for atomic units in your world, our world. Uh, but also the astronomical unit. It actually used to be uppercase in the past, but the, in its infinite wisdom, the International Astronomical Union a few years ago legislated that the astronomical unit would be abbreviated little lowercase au, exactly like the atomic unit. So we just have to live with this and depend upon context for knowing which is which, okay? But that, that's just a, a warning. Okay, but in any case, the, the real point is that the mean free path for collisions in the, these conditions are uh, gigameters, right, 10 to the 9th meters. And for uh, momentum transfer in electron neutral collisions, it's even larger, 3 tenths of an astronomical unit. unit. Okay, so, well, that's the distance between Mercury and so it's a large fraction of the scale of our solar system. That's, micros that's the microscopic scale in a diffuse interstellar cloud. Uh, the other thing, what, what do we have? Uh, uh, the UV starlight produces photoelectrons, mostly from the dust particles, the photoelectric process involving the smallest dust particles or the very, very largest molecules. And these photoelectrons at birth typically three and a half electron volts, a few electron volts, 
the main street path, again, is the order of a tenth of an astronomical unit uh, for electron neutral collisions and even larger for Coulomb interactions. Again, because the, it's a weakly ionized plasma and the Coulomb interactors uh, are uh, so far apart. Okay, I'm going to have to stop, I think, after uh, this slide so that it's, uh, the next speakers uh, stay closer to schedule. But I did want to mention an important part of the environment. Uh, I've mentioned starlight plays a role. And on the typical astronomer's log log graph, doubly logarithmic scales, this is the uh, logarithm of the frequency times the flux per unit frequency of background star, well, background light units of vertex per second per square centimeter, uh, versus the log of frequency of radiation in, uh, in hertz. And uh, what we see here is something that has three major peaks and a, an additional secondary peak. And notice here, this is one gigahertz, uh, radio frequencies, 100 gigahertz uh, uh, millimeter wavelengths. Here, and the first peak is the peak of the cosmic background radiation, the relic of the cosmic fireball of the Big Bang, which is expanded and cooled down to 2.7 Kelvin, uh, and is observed to have very precisely a textbook example of a plot function spectral energy distribution. That's an observed fact about the cosmic background radiation. Uh, and that's what I've drawn in the slide for the first peak. There's a second peak because the uh, microscopic dust particles are so effective at absorbing uh, any starlight and uh, putting themselves into a kind of equilibrium balance between the visible and ultraviolet starlight they absorb and the far infrared radiation that they re-radiate. And this is by balancing the rates of absorption and emission for realistic absorption coefficients for the kinds of materials that we have in space. Uh, in the background's average background starlight, that equilibrium temperature for the dust particles is about 15 Kelvin, roughly speaking. Uh, but with a fairly long tail, it's not a perfect light body. Then this is the bulk of the starlight itself, peaking in the visible spectrum, near infrared to visible. And then there's an extra special contribution from the very hottest stars that are sources of ultraviolet to extreme ultraviolet radiation. So uh, that's a part of the uh, uh, background story. One can also use the radio astronomer's way of representing brightness of radiation in terms of the equivalent temperature of a black body that would have the same brightness at that frequency. And if we plot the brightness temperature, then that diagram looks like this. You can barely see um, the uh, uh, a slight change in slope that corresponds to uh, the stellar peak and the dust peak. What dominates is just this flat region, the constant 2.7 Kelvin, uh, perfectly Planckian uh, brightness temperature. Uh, then the radiation, the background radiation shoots up enormously, and that's due to non-thermal processes in space. Uh, synchrotron radiation, yes, there are. There are particle accelerators in space. Um, OK, I, uh, I'm going to have to continue with the rest of the story in the second lecture. Um, so I'll create But um, again, uh, just to summarize, we're dealing um, with microscopic processes that we have to find a way to relate to the macrocosm. This, this wonderful universe filled with all, all sorts of startling phenomena, including the ones we're familiar with, planets and 
and stars like the sun, but also much more, many more exotic things. Atoms and molecules play an important role, uh, very different from what we see in the laboratory. And so that's what the story of astrochemistry is about. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up the story in, in another lecture, and then you're going to hear other uh, approaches to various parts of the lectures. Thank you.